going to kick off our session for everyone who's joined us from all over the world and all over Africa. My name is Caitlin Nash, and I am the founding partner of a company called Loud Hailer, which, if you had to guess, does a lot of loud hailing. So close on a decade ago, I had the privilege of starting a business called Loud Hailer, which really had this vision and mission to raise visibility of startups on the African continent and to form partnerships that were not only pan-African, but global. And along that journey of working with all players in the innovation value chain, we had the experience of working with startups, with governments, with uh, universities, with various investment vehicles that go along that innovation chain. And it's been a fascinating journey for, and I'm sure for many of you that operate in the innovation ecosystem to be part of the ecosystems that have so rapidly matured in various areas. So if we look back on the various innovation systems within South Africa, within Egypt, within Nigeria, within Uganda, within Ghana, I think we can see marked milestones of progress within a two, three, four, five, six, seven year period. So within that very exciting journey that we went on working with tech accelerators that were coming into Africa, with startups that were raising multi-million dollar rounds, we really saw this need to, to close a couple of gaps where as an African continent, we could really collectively unify around the lessons we've learned and the areas that we can, can join together around global partnerships. And with that, um, through networking, you know how it goes, we had this phenomenal opportunity to form an initiative called the Global Innovation Initiative Group, GIG, which is purposely ironic for all of us in the tech ecosystem. And, and out of this initiative, we've been able to pull together various global participants and, and really looking to connect Africa and connect the world in a way that is meaningful for significant accelerated growth in our tech and innovation ecosystems here in Africa. There is a burgeoning demand for investors and for companies and for individuals to get involved in the African tech scene. And while there are many opportunities and many programs operating across the continent, for those of us that are operating on a grassroots level and have been working in the space, we know that there is a huge need to fill in terms of funding and growing startups and scaling the innovators who are solving Africa's problems. So it's fantastic to be here. Um, this year, what we birthed was the inaugural launch of the Global Startup Awards. It is the world's largest independent startup competition, and we very proudly were able to bring that to the African continent. So we have been forming partnerships and scouting talent in 55 countries across Africa. We've met the most wonderful people. Many of you on the call have either dealt with the gig team, the GSA team, or the Loud Hailer team. And I'll tell you, there is a vibrant, intelligent, competent, driven group of people that are working within this network to raise innovation on the African continent into the global stage. Right, so with that being said, for those that have just joined now, please tell us where you're from, tell us who you are, please share your LinkedIn profile. We would love to use this opportunity for people to connect all around the world and all around Africa. Um, a few quick little house rules. Uh, for the benefit of others, please keep your microphone off during the session. Uh, if you accidentally put it on, the moderator will intentionally put it off. <laughs> please keep your video on. It's lovely to see faces. Um, if you would so like to do. And we will be dealing with Q&A. So questions are welcome as we have conversations, as our wonderful speakers share with us in the next 45 minutes to half an hour. Please put your sessions, uh, your questions into the chat. We have a team who are capturing those questions. And after the speakers have inputted, we will be reading out some of those questions and engaging on them and making notes around them. So please do that. The session is being recorded. We will share it and we'll make sure you all have access to it. And um, yeah, please, we, we'd love you to engage. Right. So we have put together quite a powerhouse of people representing different parts of the African continent. And I'd like to just quickly read out who they are who have will be joining us tonight. 
So first up, we will have Noah Shaker. She is from Egypt. She's the Secretary General of the Egyptian Fintech Association and Vice President of the Africa Fintech Network. She's also a partner in the Commerce Tech segment of the Global Startup Awards Africa. Noah, welcome. We look forward to hearing from you in a bit. We will also be joined by Kenneth Lesghesi. He is the CEO and Chief Investment Officer and co-founder of Autis Africa Capital. Kenneth, it's wonderful to have you here tonight. You've come all the way from consulting to startup to investor, and we really are looking forward to hearing your input tonight. We also have Victor Obama. And I, uh, please forgive me, Victor, if I have not pronounced your surname correctly. I am open to an education across the board, as we all are. He is the co-founder of VicFast Integrated Solutions Limited, and Victor comes bringing us his perspective from Nigeria as a strong, vibrant ecosystem partner there. We also have Ifi Umnana from Nigeria. She is the co-founder and co-CEO of Nourishing Africa. We're very excited to have Ifi and her team on board. We obviously see agriculture, agri-tech, and particularly women empowerment in that space as a key driver behind what we are collectively trying to achieve here. We are also very privileged to welcome Dr. Peter Ayim from Nigeria. Dr. Ayim is the founder of the Pan-African Youth Chamber of Commerce, Industry, Trade and Tourism. He is a country partner to the Global Startup Awards Africa. And Dr. Ayim, we are very much looking forward to your measured insights on the deployment of capital to scaling startups. Right, so just a reminder as we kick off, please tell us who you are, where you're from, and perhaps what you'd like to know and achieve from this session. Today, particularly, we are going to be taking a time out to talk about funding models in Africa, particularly within the tech startup and innovation space. I, many years ago with one of my, my very first jobs, I worked for a very wise minister within the political system. And I will never forget when he said to me, Caitlin, don't try and change the old, build the new. Don't try and dismantle systems that are old and archaic and to improve them. Work with those who wanna work with you, build new. And it's always resonated with me. And I think what is happening during this time, particularly with COVID, where the ability to connect and join in the accelerated borderless world just exploded. For those who were driven to build new systems, the timing was perfect. And that is what's happened here. We've been able to facilitate conversations in multiple countries around the world. We've been able to connect with some of the most influential, educated and experienced players in the innovation ecosystem. And the time is certainly now that as COVID is, is looking to, I wouldn't say come to an end, but as we are moving into an era where people are appropriately geared up to launch new programs, we are very proud to be able to bring everyone together in the Global Startup Awards Africa and as well as in the Gig Network. Oh, yeah. Right, so a reminder, please keep your microphones on silent. We are particularly talking about funding models tonight. So talking about building new systems versus trying to change old ones. There is absolutely a phenomenal display of funding activity for tech startups on the continent. But with it has come a lot of deepening dialogues around what is truly constructive and what is truly the right way to collect and deploy that capital. What we have done is we've saw some of the best speakers on the topic, and we've also looked to speak to those that have had direct experience where how you deploy this funding at a grassroots level into these startups can also be considered. Right, so with all eyes on Africa as a final frontier, I would very much like to kick off our session and to start to hear from one of our speakers. Right, we'll be chatting about a couple of topics tonight. The first topic we'll be 
be chatting about is the state of investments into African startups and why international investment frameworks are ill-suited for African startups. We've had this conversation around how Silicon Valley cannot fit onto Africa. We've also been watching how, particularly within the fintech space, Africa is well known globally for the leapfrogging ability of our fintech uh, applications and disruption in global markets. So with that on board, we asked Noah to have a talk to us. So Noah, you live and breathe the space. You have been listed as one of the power fintech leaders shaping the future of the financial industry. We're very privileged to have you here. And no, we're not going to go through, through an interview style. Really, we wanted to give you the stage to give us your opinion on what is happening in the fintech space in Africa. We know that neobanks are launching. We know there's micro lenders that are rapidly spreading across the continent. We know that over 66% of the African continent is unbanked. We know that a third of the working population is, is going to be coming from Africa, servicing the global market. So there's a lot of moving parts happening here, but with that, there's also policy and regulation challenges and adjusting to cryptocurrencies and blockchains. It would be fantastic if we could get your, your perspective on where you think the state of investments into African startups are, how you think investment frameworks are working, and then perhaps a bit of insight on, on FinTech in Africa. So over to you, Noah. Thank you very much, Caitlin. I mean, thank you first for having us. Thank you for availing that beautiful platform, bringing together all the, the, the knowledgeable, well-experienced and, and, and um, innovative speakers to, to actually bringing us together is, is a learning experience for us all, even before it being uh, 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 a learning experience for our audience. I, I really don't know how you expect me to cover all that in 10 minutes, but I'm going to try my best to limit and keep it to, to 10 minutes. Thank you for uh, putting together like that context. I would like to add a few comments to that prior to us actually starting to look into not just the fintech investment scene, but the investment scene around Africa and in, in, um, in general. Um, although we have received a lot of funding as an African continent, but the African startups are still not as well funded as other startups, if you compare them to the ones in Latin America, for example, if you compare them to uh, the ones in the Far East, in India, for example, so like the African startup would um, um, receive an average of 1.4 million in, in a seed round. That uh, uh, a similar startup in India would receive a bit more than 4 million, perhaps 4.3 on average. Another one in uh, 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 Latin America would either receive around 5.5 to 5.7 in average in, in funding in the seed stage. Um, and when you look at where the investments go, they actually go to four to five African markets and they leave the rest of the 54 uh, 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 unserved and unlike there are opportunities in there. I mean, um, I operate in 34 African countries right now and the number is growing. There are opportunities outside Egypt, uh, Kenya, Nigeria uh, uh, and South Africa. And those opportunities are worth investment. Why is that happening? For a very, very good reason. And it's not because venture capitalists or institutional investors or other investment uh, vehicles are bad and they don't want to be there. It's simply because investors prior to entering or investing in a fintech that operates in a certain country, they have to have that clarity and understanding about all the social, um, uh, economic, uh, political environments where those startups actually operate. And this is not always uh, um, easily done, especially when you get the majority of your investment from uh, uh, international investors who haven't lived in Africa or operated in those markets that they wish to invest in. So what can we do in here? We can partner. We can partner with local 
uh, uh, entities. We can partner with uh, uh, local investors. We can hire general partners from the country where we are seeking to, to invest. There's a huge opportunity in here and we cannot waste such opportunity and not utilize it just because we haven't operated in, in those countries. So there is a solution. Touching based on what you've said about women empowerment, if you look at Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, it has the biggest percentage of women entrepreneurs in the world, and that's about 27%. Women-led startups in Africa received only 15% of the funding that is directed towards the continent. And that is one thing that we actually wish and should work uh, towards changing. Not because uh, uh, we are feminists or we're fighting for equality, but because this is the sound economic decision to make. Women represent 50% of the population. If you do not have women very well represented on your boards, in your management teams, if you do not have women catering to the needs of 50% of the population, this is a loss. This is going to hit your bottom line heavily. And when we look at the fact that women are accumulating wealth currently at a much higher rate than men are, and that they represent billions of purchase and power in dollars, you should, as a service provider, look into what those ladies need, because again, that's a huge market opportunity to uh, uh, actually waste. So if you look at like uh, 1.5 billion of investments that have gone into uh, fintechs in 2020, the US-based startups got 73% out of those. The African startups got only 1.2%. That's around like uh, 105 billion that got invested in, that, in, in, in fintechs in Africa in the year 2020. And the majority of the investment goes actually towards A plus, like slightly mature startups who are more or less in growth phase. And we do not get enough funding for the early stage startups. I've been operating in that scene. I mean, I built and ran and accelerated the very first FinTech accelerator in the country like seven, eight years ago when that FinTech was still a new thing in there. I was uh, like heavily involved in the operations of a couple of venture capital funds that are focused on tech and fintech. And I've always complained and heard others complaining about the fact that there aren't any mature uh, ready for investment uh, fintech startups around the continent. Well, it's a really young ecosystem. We are still starting. There is a huge potential and waiting for the fintechs to actually grow and scale and prove uh, 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 that they can be profitable and where you can assess and, and like apply the same measures that you apply on other industries when uh, considering investment is not the right thing to do because good fintechs in Africa that are investment ready are not to be found, they are to be built first. So what's the second advice and how up to VCs who want to operate in Africa, you should engage in early stage lending. And there are a lot of risk metagans on the ground that can be deployed to make sure that you still look after the best interests of your investors and not waste the, the, the money and lose it. And we are called venture capitalists for a reason. That refers to our risk appetite. So when we set that aside, we, when we are looking at such uh, 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 market, then we are not doing what we should be doing uh, uh, properly. Engage in building. There are multiple models like a venture builder model that goes hand in hand with the VC. Oh, one other thing we need to keep in mind now with the Paris Agreement and the focus on the ESG and SDG lending, we have an enormous amount of money to supply in 
if we want to achieve those goals by the year 2030, where is that money going to come from? It's going to come from the private sector. The private sector needs the appropriate vehicles in place to direct and channel that money towards green uh, fintechs, towards tech in general that can support that, that zero emission goal that we want to reach. So we need to look into agri-tech, we need to look into health tech, we need to look into insure techs that can actually support uh, uh, investing in somehow risky markets and, and the like, providing the needed and necessary coverage and, and enhancing the resilience of the businesses that we invest at. This should also be kept on the radar and it should not be uh, ignored. Is there innovation in the investment uh, seen in Africa in general? Yes, of course. And you have mentioned a few yourself. We're not just referring to peer-to-peer -peer lending and, and, and crowdfunding, whether it's debt or it's, it's equity. There are also other uh, improvements that are happening in there and new business models that are even making markets that were exclusive before the high net worth individuals and investment tools like funds, for example, like capital markets. Now, uh, real estate. Real estate is about one of the favorite investments for Africans because that industry is doing really well uh, and is done really well over the past 20 years. But again, access to it is limited to the high net worth individuals, perhaps like the A plus, A, perhaps B plus segment of the societies. Now, if you look at tokenization as an enabler, it has offered access to a vast base of uh, uh, investors. You don't have to purchase the entire house. You can only buy a token for a, a, a part of that. The crowdfunding platforms now are evolving because they had that issue that they have faced with the liquidity of the assets. So once you're there, you cannot get out. Now they have matured. They are partnering with one another and they're creating secondary markets to overcome that issue that is there of, of liquidity. If you look at uh, uh, mutual funds, like um, again, this part of the world, people have issues with liquidity. And if you're looking at that segment, they need access to their money. So they cannot actually tie it down on, on a medium even or, or, or long term. So there are startups and uh, there's one in, in, um, in, in Indonesia. Um, uh, I, I, I forgot the name. Uh, Fundastic, Fundastic, that's the name of the platform they have actually overcome that uh, uh, barrier and now they're expanding that base of retail investors who are putting money in uh, uh, the funds because they have tackled that issue of uh, uh, liquidity uh, uh, for fund investors. So fintechs are definitely helping to, they are uh, fintechs that engage in the investment scene are helping the rest of the fintechs that operate in banking, that operate in insurance, insure tax, that are an, an alternative finance fintechs are helping the rest of tech models. So it's like help me, help you help yourself model. So fintechs are actually supporting uh, 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 one another, raising funds and capital. So they're really, really exciting times and, and um, changes that are happening, growth that is happening and the emergence of certain models as well, like blended finance, takes us back again to the SDGs and uh, 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 ESG finance and funding. And blended finance in simple terms happens when you have a development entity partnering with a private sector entity or more of them to offer support and lending to one uh, business that is considered risky in a way but has a huge social impact once it succeeds operating on the ground. So you can find support like a, a grant to start the business and then partner with a private uh, uh, sector um, uh, fund provider who can then help the business grow. So it's a form of mitigating risk in a way, making those social businesses uh, that are that used to be perceived risky prior to that support uh, coming to them, make them more attractive for investments. And that's one 
um, what, one model that we need to actually grow and put in then under our organizations uh, that are really good at that. If you look at FSD uh, Africa, supported by the UK aid, if you look at the uh, GIZ, supported by the German government, they have actually mastered that model and they have deployed it a lot. We need plenty of those. This should be the development approach. We should be targeting support to certain social businesses that can help financial inclusion, that can help eliminate that exclusivity to service provisioning around Africa, not just financial sector, but health, education, uh, 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 travel, uh, uh, agriculture, you name it. There is opportunity everywhere. We just need to build the right collaborative models that can help us make the best use of the resources that are available on the ground. Thank you very much. I'm not going to take a, a longer. I can go on and on for hours talking about those topics. I mean, this is what I feel passionate about. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Nora. We appreciate it. And you know, these webinars are just that, the start of a conversation. Uh, Nora, just perhaps before I let you go, perhaps I can ask, which is, yes, there's going to be new collaboration and VC needs to embrace that appetite for risk, but realize there are really strong mitigation measures on the ground for building fintechs or building startups as opposed to finding them, which is certainly the African, the African opportunity in the tech scene. It, when you meet international investors that are perhaps reluctant to invest in the African scene, but know there's a big opportunity there, what, what is the one thing you say to them? to try to explain the opportunity on the horizon, yeah? Well, um, uh, one point that I've shared before, which is once you have the right partner on the ground with that understanding, you can customize the operating model. I mean, again, investment has two sides. The business side of it, like raising the funds and then deploying the funds, the actual decision to invest in the startup. And the other important aspect of it is how you operate on the ground. How do you source in the fintechs? How do you select the fintechs? How do you evaluate and do your due diligence process? Those processes make or break the decision and they cannot operate uh, separately. So once you have the right partner on the ground, you get the right insights into the market. So you build the right operating models that can help you mitigate those risks that are there. One other thing that I always say that the African markets luckily are very similar in nature. They are facing the more or less, more or less the same challenges. They have more or less the same customer needs. And that makes scaling and multiple going regional, going and African really easy for startups. So that can help mitigate the market risks that most of the investors worry about. So whenever I'm involved with a startup, I encourage them to put their expansion, regional expansion plans prior to approaching those investors because operating for five markets is totally different than operating in a single one but from a risk perception perspective for, for um, investors. The second thing I say, it's like no pain, no gain. If you are unwilling to accept the risk, you are not going to exit at 30X and, and 40X and like the numbers that we do not see any, anywhere else in, in the world. That's the beauty of emerging markets, the beauty of the African market. But again, you have to accept the challenges on the ground, actually embrace them and, and, and look at them as an opportunity to differentiate yourself, an opportunity to make investments that get you not just the, um, the, the financial return, but also creates the right impact on the ground that makes sure that you touch lives and change things. And that's what Fintechs does. Thank you, Nora. And I think that's such a valid point is, is looking at new funding models, perhaps when we look at global partners coming into Africa, uh, or even big corporates that are looking to, to invest in the space. You know, we're seeing an increasing amount of banks and of commercial entities that are looking to get into investing in startups across the continent. Um, and I think it's about shifting this mindset from being a capital provider only and understanding that you are involved and that you need to find a really strong, connected, experienced operator in your markets that you want to move in. 100%. Thank you, Noah. Right. So let's move on to hear from our next speaker. Having 
looked at some of the statistics of the economic powerhouses that will be on the African continent. The reality is that by 2015, 10 of the biggest cities in the world will be in Africa. In just the next 10 years, a collection of Africa's biggest 18 cities will reach $1.3 trillion in spending. And that's certainly the kind of commercial scale that will support and galvanize new ventures. So talking about new ventures, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who is Kenneth. Kenneth, we are really grateful to have you here. Uh, having actually worked in an angel investment space and running your own capital um, flow of investment into startups, we would love to hear your thoughts on how to support entrepreneurs in Africa through a venture building model. Uh, what are some of the nuances that you've noticed on the ground? And, and bearing in mind on the call, we, we probably have a lot of startups who are trying to access funding. Um, and for your for the startups that are on the call, please make sure that you have entered the Global Startup Awards Africa. That's one way that you, you can access funding through our partners. And for everybody else on the call who are perhaps venture capitalists themselves or running a fund or working in the capital scene, it would be wonderful to hear your perspective. So Kenneth, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh... Uh, Caitlin, like Noah said, uh, thank you for arranging this and, uh, and, and for a chance to share with the rest of Africa and, and for all of us to connect. We never talk together as, as ecosystems. Um, I am Kenneth Legacy. I'm the CEO at uh, Otis Africa Capital, where I double as the Chief Investment Officer. And I think I'm building on some of the, the themes and trends that were, were shared by Noah, really. Uh, we, we acknowledge that there's growing amounts of capital coming to the African startup ecosystem. Actually, this year alone, we are on record to hit uh, to hit uh, to go above two billion in capital again. About three hundred and thirty-eight percent growth on twenty twenty. Twenty twenty was a bad year because of, uh, of course, COVID nineteen. However, as Noah alluded to, there are certain sectors, certain countries, uh, and certain biases in the way this capital is uh, is allocated. A majority of it really is going to to countries which have been mentioned already. Uh, I mean, those four countries, Egypt, Kenya, South Africa, and Nigeria represent 80% of capital uh, to startups in the continent and certain sectors. Uh, fintech, and, and it's maybe reflected in the, the first person who has spoken at the, at, the, at the event today, at the webinar. But fintech uh, is, is, is attracting about 66% of that funding. And, and for me, what's interesting, I see fintech as the the building blocks, the rails on which you put then other sectors to be able to deliver whether capital or when I see entrepreneurs, I see them as solving problems. And for us as a globe, those problems have to be linked to the sustainable development goals. So I see other sectors then following. So transport and logistics, maybe commerce and trade, uh, energy and, and resources, especially around things like solar power and other forms of renewable energy, and then new technologies, what we call emerging technologies and things like data science, uh, cryptography, a blockchain that, that uh, help Africa to leapfrog as it were. And of course, healthcare, which is important. So uh, FinTech aside, it's important that funding is able to be attracted to the other sectors. Now, FinTech attracted 66% of funding on the continent. The other sectors, uh, the next sector, which was transport and logistics, got about 8.5% of funding. So you can see there's an order of magnitude in difference in funding. Uh, and it might not be that FinTech is the only game in town, but uh, all that is the most important, but it might just be, and I'll come to the reason why, but it might just be that we are not seeing the entrepreneurs in the other sectors. Um, also, while we've gotten funding uh, to entrepreneurs on the continent, if you split it by gender, only 10.5% of funding by value goes to female-led entrepreneurs. And, and so there's certain profile of entrepreneurs, whether by race, by gender, by educational networks or exposure, these entrepreneurs are not getting access to, are not getting access to, to funding. Uh, so, so as we discuss new investment models and frameworks for Africa, I think what's important to recognize is that yes, we need more capital, um, especially to, to meet uh, our needs. And I frame these with the SDGs, 
But more importantly as well, we need models that then work for, for Africa. And, and you said uh, it's important to talk to the entrepreneurs that are on the call, uh, especially in light of some of the things you're, you're doing, I know as, as, as GSA and as uh, GIIG. But uh, <clears throat> really, when I step back and look at the current international frameworks for funding, which was one of the area topics we want to debate today, I find that uh, they tend to rely more on, uh, on uh, models and work in ecosystems that I would say are more mature, where entrepreneurs maybe have a better grasp of what their funding needs are, uh, can easily find investors, and there's a relative abundance of investors they can go talk to. And, uh, and also, because of the economics of uh, the venture funding model, most times the investors will be looking for unicorns. Uh, so, so, however, when you step back then and think about what we need as Africa, uh, I think we need startups that are, yes, going to give an economic return, good risk adjusted return, but we need to be focusing more maybe on startups that one, I think will create jobs at scale, will deliver on SDGs and will be inclusive in their business models. So uh, making sure we are, we are addressing needs and targeting even uh, women and the youth. Uh, while, of course, getting appropriate risk-adjusted returns. So what does that mean for a model for funding in Africa? And therefore, what is important for our entrepreneurs to know is that we need funding that will create a lot of winners by, by, uh, by backing them early. So that is at the pre-seed or seed stage, in my view, in their journey, because the more you have at the top of the, the funnel, the more you have going through to that Series A and Series B. I'll give you the ex experience in, um, in say, Uganda or East Africa, Rwanda, Kenya. I, I see the same when I've been operating in the region. There is uh, investors that have set up to fund companies that are seeking perhaps $5 million plus. And you see a challenge around deal flow, more of a quality deal flow. So we, we, we need investment or funding models that make it easy, make it equitable, that make it sustainable from a unity economics point of view to invest in the startups at, at that early pre-seed seed stage. Uh, in addition, we need these frameworks that uh, provide for an equal opportunity for startups. And uh, maybe this is where I commend uh, the work being done by, uh, by GSA uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and a Global Startup Awards. And uh, by, by you working with a lot of the local entrepreneurial ecosystem, you're able to then find uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs, not just in the, the big ecosystems, but across the continent, because I saw the competition is open to uh, startups from across, across the continent. So, so these frameworks, and when we equalize opportunity like that, first off, we remove the selection bias within, uh, within the startups that can get funding. So everyone is equally likely to get a chance at funding. But secondly, uh, for investors, which is important, we avoid uh, the fear of missing out. It means uh, investors do not want to miss out on an opportunity they should have seen that could give them those returns or enables uh, delivery of that impact. So, so it's important then that you have the mesh and, and, uh, and, and, and this mesh is like a jigsaw where you have investors with uh, the local entrepreneurial support organizations. And I'll come later to the role of public sector as well, but you need to have them all working together. We are seeing this happening now increasingly, and I can give the example of Uganda, of Nigeria, of Kenya, of uh, Tanzania, where uh, through organizations such as the Kampala Angel Investment Network, which I'm, I'm also part of and which I co-founded, we are able to, to work with uh, ecosystems in other countries. So I've had the chance to, to mentor and work on accelerator programs, say in Nigeria, in, in, in Kenya, in Tanzania, in Rwanda, uh, and, and, and look to train and share experiences, say with venture investors in those other countries, so that one, you're able to see deal flow across the continent at all, at, at all levels. And two, you're able to bring down the cost of seeing that deal flow because you're working with people who are locally based and can source, and you're able to see uh, to see that deal flow at, at not as much cost. And this is being reflected maybe in the, in the investment funding models we are seeing. Um, so we're seeing an evolution around uh, 
around uh, syndication uh, or syndication of deals for, for smaller pools of capital. And the importance of this is that it, it brings uh, startup funding closer to local investors. Uh, actually, at uh, Kampalenjo Investment Network right now, we are we're going through uh, and launching our deal book where we get a chance for groups of small local investors to see local startups that they can put money in, not just in Uganda, but through networks we then have in other countries with other angel networks. We're able to bring them deal flow from other countries as well. Um, so, so these are some of the things around the current investment frameworks from that, that would be more suited for Africa. Uh, the, the, the funding, when you look at where the funding is coming from, uh, that is investing in the continent, it's, uh, it's mostly been, we've mostly been relying on foreign capital. And when I say that, I mean, maybe international development financing institutions, global VCs that are looking for Africa exposure. Um, but, but, but maybe it's important now, and the model we need is to start to bring local capital to play. And, and maybe the way we can do that is, uh, and why it's important to do that, is because what local capital does, it can uh, de-risk opportunities because local capital in, in most cases is on the ground with these entrepreneurs and it can act as uh, providing that role of mentorship and business development, uh, which brings me on to some of the work we're then doing as, uh, as uh, entrepreneur support uh, organizations or as uh, actors who are investing at the early stage. Uh, so at at uh, at Lotus Africa Capital, for example, we we intentionally invest at the pre-seed seed stage, which is what I've been talking about today. And when we invest, we we look to 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 act as that first co-founder investor with uh, with entrepreneurs. And mm. so it means you're supporting them by providing uh, venture building and and technical assistance support uh, through uh, running uh, periodic venture building sessions. Uh, and and, uh, and uh, in those sessions, entrepreneurs are learning things as simple as problem solution fit, product market fit, uh, knowing what it means to attract VC capital and uh, what the expectation is in terms of being ready for investors, scaling and growing your business and, and, and a path to exit. Uh, and, and when you do this uh, venture building and technical assistance for, for entrepreneurs, it is with the view that you want to de-risk them and you want to make them more attractive to follow on capital to grow. However, there's something that Noha mentioned that was very important. It's important then that for Africa, the kind of investment framework and the kind of investment models we need have to be the kind that unlock a blend of capital. Uh, and, and so that means a blend of capital, not just foreign capital, but local capital. Uh, but also types of capital. And, and, and we've had over the past 12, 18 month, 18, 12 to 18 months, a chance to experiment with that type of capital. So you need the type of capital that blends the grants or um, uh, equity-free type capital with, uh, with more commercial capital and knowing where this capital should play appropriately. But what goes with that as well is then the the regulatory framework to make sure that happens. And this is where our governments would help. Uh, and, and I know over the continent, we've been seeing uh, startup acts. I think first it was Tunisia, then Senegal, then Rwanda is mulling one, and then Kenya is also considering one. And then in Uganda, which is home for me, uh, we have um, uh, set up an umbrella organization called Startup Uganda for the entrepreneur support organizations to come together. And one of the tasks for, for that Startup Uganda as a body is to put forward what would be a startup act for Uganda. So the regulatory framework is important to make the domiciles, uh, each country in Africa, and therefore attract capital and increase chances for entrepreneurs, uh, are conducive for, for, for startups. But, but, but I'm also seeing an interesting regulation that is supporting on the exit and liquidity side, which is the next point. And I see in, in Egypt, there's uh, there uh, rules for special purpose acquisition companies, SPARCs, and Zimbabwe also just passed its laws, is, is also considering the same. So it's important to build that regulatory framework. It's important then to de-risk much and provide liquidity. And uh, NOHA provided some excellent examples of uh, fintechs that are aiding in this space. 
and I won't go so much into them. But more importantly as well, if we're going to make local capital come to play and increase the chance for funding, it's important that pub public capital can be used to anchor capital for local man managers. So these are the frameworks that I think would work. Because uh, speaking as, as uh, say, someone who's trying to raise money as a local fund manager for the first time, a lot of the times you won't have the track record to, to, to make a case. But if, you can if we can have public capital that backs local managers and supports them together with foreign capital, that is LP capital, then you start to build a local ecosystem for funding and increase chances of funding for entrepreneurs. Uh, and, and what goes hand in hand then with this is uh, having those then innovative financing structures. The world has been revolutionized by the, the simplified argument for future equity, which has its origins in Silicon Valley with, uh, with, uh, with the YC. However, uh, for, for Africa, we then need to see other models and, and we're seeing them, for example, uh, I see models around uh, revenue-based financing backed by, say, equity, or I see models around, uh, um, uh, again, uh, uh, com convertibles, but, uh, but, 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 but uh, mm -hmm. linked to revenue. So, so these are the kind of models then that we need for entrepreneurs to be able to yeah. get funding. Kenneth, I mean, you've just been so wildly informative and, and saying all the right things. Can I check you're based in London at the moment? Is that correct? Yes, I am yes. based in London. Fantastic. London. Kenneth, there is so much to say about what you've said from, from equalizing opportunity across the continent. And, and, you know, thank you for applauding the work that the Global Startup Awards is doing. And, and I think it speaks to that, is how do we create equal opportunity for the startups? to have access to this flow of funding. And if you listen to the comments you're making, very quickly, countries, governments are moving towards a space to solve this problem around early stage investing, which I think is an important market signaler for those global funds that are looking to operate on the continent. I am gonna move across to Ify, who I know has a very short amount of time to share with us. So if we can, can move across to hear input, so Victor, bear with us. We, we're going to let ladies go first for a second. Ify, it would be wonderful to hear from you why international organizations are establishing roots in the African market and how you think startups could respond to this. Hi, Caitlin. Um, thank you for having me and thank you to your team as well for this wonderful event. It's much needed and it's really exciting to have these conversations. I think it's really important that we all discuss ways to ensure that we can uplift African startups, particularly in my case, agribusinesses. Uh, my name is Ifi Amuna. I am the co-CEO of Nourishing Africa and um, Nourishing Africa is a knowledge and membership platform aimed at helping agri-food SMEs scale um, across the continent. Um, and we are present across 36 countries. Um, and for me, I think I'm going to quickly talk about what it means for a startup to try and harness funding from um, the international organizations that are establishing roots in Africa. And my perspective is slightly different. Um, I am talking more to the entrepreneurs themselves and how to actually access this funding. Um, and for us, what we've seen both as Nourishing Africa, which itself is a startup, um, and was able to um, be funded by the MasterCard Foundation and the United States African Development Foundation, which again is an international organization. Um, we have seen through both our work and our members' work that there are a few things um, that stand out from those who are really good at accessing funding to the point where you would think they have a playbook to those who are really struggling. Um, and we've seen that this is through multiple areas of work or the way they engage in their fundraising. So I'm going to start first with the business model because we've seen that a lot of agribusinesses in particular um, have found a what I would call a mechanism to ensure that they're really able to ensure that their businesses are positioned in, in a way that they not only add value to the ecosystem, but they are providing some form of proposition that makes sense. Um, the first aspect is that they're demand driven and they have measurable value addition. Um, and one big thing is that they incorporate tech and innovation. Uh, for many, particularly within the African agriculture food space, we see that 
um, ag tech is something that has quickly become um, the brainchild and, and the most famous child of the family, um, much of which receives the most funding within you know, the full value chain and landscape. We've also seen that these agribusinesses that are fundraising have simple, compelling branding that stands out, that are that's able to attract their audience, um, and they're able to adapt to change to rapid um, um, areas that, such as COVID-19, um, climate change, and so forth. Um, but the one thing I really want to discuss is the idea that within startups, there's an element of trying to assess how to attain funding, um, how to ensure that you are positioned well to do so. And we've seen some very exciting models. The first being Cow Tribe in, in Ghana, which is essentially an Uber for vets um, and for last mile distribution vets, uh, where you can, through your USSD code or your um, normal uh, phone can access um, veterinary services across Ghana. And we've seen Tweeger as well, which many um, organizations know, but I'm going to talk about four main parts. And the first is around uh, branding and communication strategies. And one of our members rightfully said, you need to understand what you're selling, who you're selling to, why people buy from you um, and how much people are willing to pay. And I think for many startups in particular, this is something that um, they really struggle with because as a, a, a owner or as the, the um, leader of an organization, you often think that your business is one of a kind, even when it's not. Um, and it's very important to really try and assess what it is you're adding to the ecosystem and how, how um, straightforward or how easy it is to consume to not only the um, audience that you're trying to reach, but funders who are interested in seeing how you go about this. The other is around talent um, and ensuring that your team is structured in a way that not only provides um, comfort and reassurance to your funders, but to those that you engage with. Um, followed by partnerships, as well as ensuring that you have structured your business model in such a way, um, as well as your operations that allows not only your, your target audience um, and your consumers, but your funders to really um, have confidence in what you're doing. And for us, we've really seen that within, when it comes to why international organizations are, are you know, establishing roots in Africa, when you look at the agriculture and food space, it's a $1 trillion industry or it has the potential to be. Um, as much as we love to eat, everyone loves to eat, we have to eat. So at the end of the day, as much as there's oil and there's this and there's that, we have to eat. Um, and therefore, it's really important to analyze how we can use food to really grow not only the agriculture and food space and see us as food secure, um, which is really the ultimate goal for us at Nourishing Africa, but I think for most people who are in the sector um, and to become net exporters of food to the world, but we really need to see how we can um, position agriculture and food to really um, become an area where investors are not afraid to invest their money, which is currently the case, where we de-risk um, various aspects of the value chain and we're able to see um, growth in the sector. The last thing I'm really going to touch on is um, the incorporation of gender and youth windows. We know not, it's not new to you know, other sectors as well, but within agriculture and food, when um, as a startup you want to engage funders, you really need to analyze it and look deeply into how is gender incorporated into your business model, into your operations? How um, are you, you know, um, adding value to women and children? How is your team structured? Um, when it comes to youth, how are you engaging youth? How are youth engaged in your business? And I think this is something that is often forgotten when thinking about something like agriculture and food. So I think those are the points that I would, um, I would talk about today. Um, but I really think it's important to consider um, funding and how, and looking deeper into how to de-risk the agriculture and food space when it comes to investment and funding. Thank you. Yeah, Effie, thank you very much. I think, I think this conversation about de-risking investments while balancing off that risk appetite of a venture capitalist and funders who are needing to build startups and not expect to find startups 
is definitely the dialogue space that we not, need to not just talk about, but actively work on. And Pan-African conversations like this with some global players is certainly the springboard where we bring those parts together. Um, more and more we're seeing that we have all the right opportunities and all the right interest in the continent. And now it's about us bringing it together. And Kenneth, you mentioned startup acts that the wave of startup acts that are taking place across the continent. Um, just last night in South Africa, we had our very first national um, ecosystem event for South Africa's own startup act. And I think all of these are a sign of the ecosystems and the startup communities formalizing. And with that formalization, we can very well expect that the funding models will follow alongside that. So if we thank you very, very much. I am now, we have a couple more speakers and we're at seven o'clock. So I want to thank everyone for participating and listening in. Um, please keep your comments going. We are collecting your questions, which we will direct to the speakers uh, in just a moment. Please tell us where you're from. Please share your LinkedIn profiles. Please use this as an opportunity to connect with one another. We are recording the session. So for all of you asking for transcripts and recordings, we are recording it and we will make sure that we share that with you. Right, Victor, I would very much like to ask you to, to give us your take on how positions can, how startups can position themselves to engage with the international organizations taking root in Africa. Brilliant. Uh... Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Victor Uche Obioma, and uh, I am the founder of Vicforce Integrated Solutions Limited, Limited, a lubricant procurement and supply company based in Lagos. I am Nigerian, and uh, briefly, I'm going to speak about uh, how startups can position themselves for uh, to take funding across uh, African uh, business ecosystem. So there is this uh, disconnect with uh, formalization, especially as it relates to uh, businesses that operate in uh, semi-formal sectors like uh, petroleum, lubricants, and that kind. Uh, the FinTech space have take, has taken uh, the major lead and has, uh, I mean, driven a lot of uh, uh, business funding into Nigeria. So we have, we've, uh, this in the first quarter of uh, 2021 alone, we have uh, had uh, somewhere around uh, 200 million, uh, 2 billion USD in funding, with Nigeria standing atop the four uh, most funded countries. Yes, yeah, so uh, startups can actually start by formalizing their businesses, ensuring that they have they are formalized. I mean, do the legal paperwork, do the legal business registrations, and that kind of thing. As 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 along with uh, putting together very strong uh, team to ensure that, yes, team uh, correlation is aligned with uh, business operations, aligned with growth opportunities, aligned with uh, business uh, trajectory, as the case may be. Then uh, again, startups can actually uh, try to ensure they keep proper uh, record, proper books of accounts, because usually when funders come around and uh, there are conversations around funding, what the fund managers want to see is that a startup is intentional with their operation, intentional with their uh, style of doing business and have proper record keeping. Another uh, uh, opportunity or another way startups can actually position themselves for funding in Africa is by ensuring that they digitize or dig digitize their operations for speed and efficiency because these days, everything happens almost at uh, the speed of light. So many times uh, I find that uh, many startups in uh, Africa actually are doing a lot, but I mean, many person, may, the world doesn't really know what they are doing because simple, uh, basic operation inputs or impl uh, implements like, uh, like websites, business pages, you find that startup, many startups do not have this or do not see the need for this. And then uh, that has created some level of disconnect, especially as it relates to startups who are operating as outside sectors like FinTech, banking, we are, which are doing so much an agribusiness. Then again, uh, startups can actually improve their visibility, so to say, by um, 
intentionally getting involved with business growth communities like uh, Y Combinator, like uh, Antler, Clubhouse, and the rest of them. So to position themselves enough to know when these conversations are ongoing or to know when uh, such kind of engagements are happening so they can actually take advantage of them. Because I found that uh, the semi-formal startups actually have one basic issue, which is the issue of not even knowing what is happening in the ecosystem that they operate in as a result of disconnection from actually where the uh, engagements and conversations that actually lead to funding are happening basically. And of course, yes, uh, when, we, when, we track, when, we retrace, when we track that back to uh, our population in Nigeria, for instance, which stands at uh, somewhere around 108 million, you find that Africa is uh, yeah, the next investment powerhouse because Africa in itself positions uh, as itself as a, a massive hub for business. Uh, with abundant human capital, with abundant human uh, natural resources that are untapped. And then uh, the population or the citizens or African citizens, as the case may be, are highly innovative and re re resilient persons. That's the way I see uh, my. Ah, I think we are having connection challenges with Victor. I think I'm going to use this as an opportunity while Victor's Victor, I think your connection is a little bit unstable. I think while we let Victor, I'm going to let your connection uh, pick up a bit more. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Peter Yim. I'm conscious of time. And I think there is so much vibrant conversation here. And I would really like to hear from Dr. Peter as well. Victor, thank you very much. We will circle back with questions as soon as the, the connection picks up again. Dr. Peter Yim, I know previously when we yeah. connected, you had fantastic, we had a fantastic conversation around, yeah, it's not just about raising this great capital, but how we deploy it. So you know, we had this conversation around the SDGs and the African Union's, African Union's Agenda 2063 and, you know, these big, big milestones that we collectively all should be working towards and the role that the tech and innovation community should be playing in that. I, I would just love to hear your thoughts on this. You know, how do we bring this all together and, and what has been your experience in this space? Thank you very much, um, Kathleen. Uh, if you can hear me, can you hear me? Am I audible enough? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Okay, that's fine. Um, I, I, I'm excited to be here, to be part of this uh, initiative. And um, I'm excited, most importantly, that I've been given the opportunity to share my thought and perspective on how we can deepen this engagement and uh, create more sustainable impact. And so um, both the SDGs, that's the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations and the African Agenda 2063 are all development frameworks that speaks to um, the diverse and complex development challenges that we have in Africa you know, that um, are requiring um, so, uh, innovative solutions to solve, okay? So, um, for instance, um, the African uh, Union Agenda 2063 seeks to create um, an integrated, prosperous, and peaceful Africa driven by its, by its own citizens and representing a dynamic force in the international uh, arena and um, the, that agenda has um, seven aspirations, you know, and um, with about 20, 20 goals and 39 priority areas. Uh, and, and that aligns essentially with um, the SDGs that uh, has 17 goals and um, 169 targets, along with uh, 231 indicators. Now, this development frameworks essentially serves as guides, you know, for us to look uh, to see the areas where there are needs for us to um, innovate solutions that can address, 
you know, all the diverse challenges that we have. Um, of course, you know that Africa is home to uh, Africa is home to about 1.2 billion people, uh, growing at an average uh, population growth rate of about uh, averaging 33 percent. Uh, in the next uh, 20, uh, by 20, uh, half of okay, by 2050, that population would have uh, doubled, and then by the next century, we are expecting that that population would, would have quadrupled. And that speaks volume to the need for us to begin to innovate solutions that will respond to the growing population demands of the growing population. Um, if it says something about food security, and, and there's a need for us to grow food that will be able to begin to plan to grow food that will feed that uh, burgeoning population as, as, as it comes on. And then I, of course, the, those development frameworks also speaks to the need for inclusivity. That as we are doing this, as we are encouraging innovations or encouraging Africans to develop solutions that would address all the diverse development challenges that we have, that it's important for us to look beyond uh, the current focus. The current focus is on uh, uh, tech. And then there are uh, non-tech solutions that are also that can also drive uh, sustainable impact. You know, so um, for me, I want to encourage that as we continue to have this conversation, there is a need for us to look beyond tech. You know, for instance, the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, you know, provides opportunities for for multi chain interventions. You know, whether as it relates to logistics, you know, value chain, as it relates to manufacturing value chain, as it relates to access to finance, and a whole lot of those um, opportunities that are that have been thrown up, you know, in the African continent. And then again, I'm an advocate of uh, backward integration. Recall yesterday, I said that there's a need for us to look inwards and see how we can, we can you know, um, develop solutions that will reasonably address our challenges before we begin to look, talk about globalization. Yes, we can globalize, but we can start by looking inwards while um, we are looking at the bigger picture. And so for me, as an M um, MSME development expert, a business development service provider, my experience has been that if you approach an average startup or entrepreneur or MSME operator, what you will get is um, um, the challenge of access to finance. But from experience, we have discovered that challenges, uh, challenge of access to finance is not the only challenge that M uh, startups or MSMEs face. That beyond access to finance, there are numerous other challenges, you know, that, uh, that, that we call uh, enterprise growth inhibitors. And so, like I said yesterday, um, my thought would be that as we continue to engage, there's the need for us, can I say something earlier on about stimulating growth? You know, so there's the need for us to uh, see how we can prepare MSMEs, you know, ahead of time before there is the need for access to finance. I suggested again yesterday that uh, once we round up this event, you know, that um, the, leading up to the next event, we should be able to create um, a mechanism that we will we'll be working with MSMEs across the 55 countries as is where, you know, so that we can begin to prepare them for competitiveness. I'll give you some examples. <clears throat> Today, as we speak, non-oil exports out of Africa are finding very, uh, I mean, finding it very difficult to have access to markets you know, across um, the, I mean, across the world. And these are essentially because our enterprise operators are not competitive. You know, they are not productive. They are not, they are not, they, they have issues with um, compliance with standards. You know, and all of these issues are issues that constitute drawbacks when you are running an enterprise. So for me, I, we have been able to develop uh, what we call um, the business development service delivery framework. And it is an intervention that seeks to help enterprise remove all the barriers, you know, that prevents growth. And so we'll be looking forward to sharing this framework with um, 
the, the uh, partners as we speak, probably after this engagement to see how we can probably refine them and then uh, domesticate them to uh, for ease of um, adaptation across, that is, across the eco space. Yeah. Okay, so those are some of the thoughts I thought I should share with us um, at that this time. That is perfect, Dr. Yim. And yes, this, as we said, this is a starting conversation. It's our very first webinar as the Global Startup Awards and as Gig Africa. And we are looking forward towards that, to looking at opportunities that are intercontinental. And I think Noah kicked off the session saying that what is great about emerging markets is that there is this tremendous opportunity to scale. And with the African Free Trade Agreement, there's even more so in terms of the potential of it to be the world's biggest market. So with that being said, I would very much like to hand over to my, because I, can I not say this man's surname? Um, I'd like to hand over to Maya and let him introduce himself. And we've been talking a lot about funding, different funding models, global players wanting to look in the African market and what they can do. And I wanna use this as an opportunity for Maya to introduce the Gig Africa Fund and the role that it thinks it will play in the ecosystem. For all of you on the call, if you are a startup looking to access funding, looking to access markets, exposure, please make sure you go and sign up to the Global Startup Awards. It's not just for winners. It's about creating a pan-African community that we can tap into to share with the world and provide you with the market access that you need and access to resources that we can learn from a cross-border collaboration point of view. Right, so that being said, Maya, uh, one of the barriers that we've identified in Africa is access to funding for startups. And it would be fantastic to hear from you about the Gig Africa Fund. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, it's, I was I'm pleasantly impressed and surprised by all our speakers because surprised in the sense that all of them were giving the same message uh the lack of understanding regarding funding uh from the rest of the world um i like to do a little background when uh, caitlin and joe uh, told us about the global startup awards and what it meant and that they are going to be involved in it and they asked us if we would like to join them in this adventure. Um, we said yes fairly quickly because it meant their, their avenue, the road that they were taking and the concept of this global startup board is very much the concept of what both Philip and I have uh, in all the other work that we have done, um, which basically it's very simple. We believe that you bet you could walk alone in a direction uh, as opposed to walk in the opposite direction with everybody else that could be going the wrong way. Um, that basically is a startup. That basically means that we are going to solve problems that people didn't have, didn't think they knew they had. We're gonna find ways of moving things, building things, uh, creating things that other people have not. Um, one of the biggest problems, and I see that it's been pointed out, is the fact that a lot of the uh, funding into the startup goes into, into um, uh, very specific areas of Africa and in very specific sectors. Now, Global Startup Awards um, has a concept which is, uh, in fact, a competition. We thought that, well, this is great because we don't have to decide uh, who we're going to invest in. The countries, 55 of them, will nominate uh, uh, in, in 12 different categories uh, their startups. They will then go to another uh, competition, which is a regional one, and then eventually will end up in the African continent finals. Um, we will, we have set up a fund that will invest in every single winner who is, who would like to be funded, of course, we don't have to force anybody to do that. And that is uh, a key. Uh, we are not, even though the, what we do is, is, is classified as venture capital, 
we're not. Uh, to us, this is, uh, it's not something that I think from memory, if I'm not mistaken, and, and Caitlin can correct me if I'm wrong, pretty much, I think the maximum you can be is five years old, as far as a startup is concerned. And that means that we are we will be looking at people who have started uh, yesterday. Uh, they probably just have an idea or they have a solution to a problem and that's, that's all they've got, all right? We will look at them. They will be in the competition and they will have a chance. There's no question about it. And that, that's the key. So sometimes the financing for these might be $50,000. Sometimes they're financing maybe 1 million. And financing, I believe, is not enough. Uh, this fund would not only finance the winners, we'll obviously look at some other um, candidates who have shown great promise in, in, um, in pot and potential in moving uh, their idea uh, their concept forward, but for some reason or other, the judges and the jury and so on and so forth thought that they should come second. Don't worry, we will look at you too. Um, but that, so we don't pick. Now, what we need to do is, again, this is something that came out today and that's what impressed me the most. We, we've, we seem to forget the youth. We seem to forget the future. The youth is something that will create the future for us. And in, in order for us to be able to do that, what we have done is, yes, uh, we will raise a certain amount of money, uh, up to $100 million. We will every year, because there is a competition every year. So therefore, there will be a new fund every year. Just We will not uh, limit ourselves to one year of competition. Every year, we'll have a separate fund. Uh, and a separate life for that matter. To that end, we have what, what I meant by the youth is that we have asked certain uh, universities in the African continent to allow us to access some of their business students in order for them to look at all the winners and look at where they are, where uh, today and where they could be tomorrow, not only in their region, but in their country, uh, and in fact, in their continent, and eventually in the world. To me, the input of the youth in what could happen in the future is imperative. It's very important. Um, I wasn't allowed to talk about my age, but people my age, we do not see the world the same way as they do, and we're not supposed to. We're supposed to see the world into the, in, through their eyes. And all of this means that the future is in startups, and that's why we are here. Um, we will not. It's it's not a it's not an easy situation. I can't promise that we will solve every problem for everybody. We won't. I can't promise that we will have funding for everybody. We won't. Uh, what I can promise is those who have won, they will not only get funding, but they will also get a certain amount of support whether it's to do with manufacturing, whether it's to do with logistics, whether it's to do with finance, whether it's to do with setting up their company, we will be there to help them because that's what we are here for. We're not just going to give a check to somebody and say, well, we'll talk to you next year and see how you've done. No, that's not it. And what impressed me even more than that was the fact that I was looking at the chat, uh, people writing things and you know asking questions about, uh, well, I am doing this and now can I be in anybody and everybody we got 12 categories and pretty much most ideas can fit into them sign up and you never know this is not a lottery ticket this is not an easy nor is it an easy street to 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 funding it's not most probably the rigorous competition that you will go through is probably tougher than getting funding from a VC, uh, venture capitalist firm of some sort or another, because you'll be asked the questions. There'll be people who'll be looking at you, not, not because they're putting their own money in, but they, they are really going to look at this on your level, in your neighborhood. And therefore, it's the people who will come through are the people who, who, will, who will have a very, very good chance of being so successful, given the fact that they've got their funding, hopefully we'll be able to help them as much as we can 
in all other sectors. And the second uh, client, if you will, that we have, of course, are our investors. The winners of the African continent will then go on to a world competition. Now imagine that we have invested in this particular uh, uh, startup and they go ahead and win the global competition. Well, how hard is it for them to attract a lot more investors? Now that we have set them up correctly as far as, or in a, in a different way, as far as their finances, as far as their production, as far as their marketing, as far as everything else that they need. I've always said, and I've made a, 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 a joke out of it, it doesn't matter if you have decided that you've figured out a new way to dig a ditch to get some water from one field to the other. That's fine. That's okay. You know, it's an enormously, it's a great idea. And remember, the African continent is solving problems that we didn't even think we had. Um, and that's, that's super important uh, uh, for us. Did I forget something, Caitlin? Maya, thank you very much. I think I think it's a privilege for us. So for everyone on the call, just to be very clear, Maya is part of a phenomenal group of people around the globe. Maya is sitting in Switzerland and they are actively raising a fund of $100 million to invest in the winners of the Global Startup Awards. So for those who are looking for funding or looking to access funding, really what we have heard throughout this call is that there is a tremendous need to democratize access to funding for startups across Africa. And what the Global Startup Awards Africa and the Gig Africa Fund strives to do is just that, to create equal opportunities for those startups and innovators sitting in Sudan, to Uganda, to Egypt, to the mature environments in Nairobi or in South Africa, this opportunity is the pan-African vehicle for us to collectively work together to expand and scale faster into new markets across the continent, but to also just say, you don't have to know somebody. You don't have to have exclusive access to a funder or to a VC or to a very complicated bank system. Enter the awards. Get on the system. Let us start working with you. Let us start identifying the real talent that is lying on this continent. And we've got an enormous group of people around the world who are, are raising this big fund, which is a significant fund. And we'll be considering not just the unicorns that are already built, but looking specifically into early stage investing so that we can build the startups that not just Africa needs, but that the world needs. And that is what this global team has seen is that the solutions that we are building here in Africa do not just have amazing opportunity to create new industries and to be incredibly commercially successful, but also to solve problems that the rest of the world is dealing with. So Maya, I really wanna thank you for your time. Um, we appreciate, we know you come from a very experienced background from the AMA group and the Gig Africa Fund certainly is going to have a significant impact on the innovation landscape in Africa. So thank you for your time. You're welcome. And inshallah, we'll, we'll be, I'll be sitting next to you next time we have one of these events. Yes, we do hope so. We do hope so. So we, we're tight on time. These things always go so quickly. Um, I know that we've had a couple of very quick questions. And, you know, a webinar strives not just to give everybody a lot of airtime, but to show real people. Because at the end of the day, we're just real, willing, ambitious people that are competent, that have fantastic networks. And if we can pull together to have the same goal, we will certainly look back in, in the years to come and see the impact that we've made. And that's why we kicked off the call with a powerful woman like Noah, who's been there, who's done that, who seven years ago ran the first FinTech Accelerator before there was one, and is currently operating in 34 countries in Africa. So collectively, as we pull together, we can start to see the real opportunity there for, for growth in the continent. Right, so before we close off with some of our questions, please remember the Global Startup Awards are closing on the 30th of September. Please ensure that you announce as far and wide on your networks. Make sure that you, if you are a startup, that you apply. If you yourself are a venture capitalist looking to co-invest with the Gig Africa Fund, please ensure that your portfolio companies are on the Global Startup Awards. Um, only those who are entered will qualify for access to the Gig Africa Fund. All right. Right, so I have noticed that a couple of you are sharing questions and answering them on the group, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, 
one question we had was for Kenneth. Kenneth, can you emphasize on collaboration and partnerships that you are busy trying to build on the continent? And how do we bridge the gap and address the challenge of sourcing funders, but also accessing markets? So similar questions, similar themes. Kenneth, I don't know if you want to give a, a comment to that. Yes, uh, I'd like to give a comment. So the, 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 the collaborations we are doing at the moment, because we adopt a venture building approach, we found it easiest to work with other either entrepreneur support organizations or others, other investors that run similar venture building so we can co-facilitate with them. And what it means is we get to know them as investors. We get to know the pipeline of uh, companies they're funding who may be in other markets. And we can then bring those companies to either investors in our local market or we can invest in them ourselves. So, so those are the kind of collaborations. But really it's around making sure we are working together with entrepreneurial support organizations to up the quality of the support we give the entrepreneurs or make sure we increase the chances and visibility for these startups and entrepreneurs to get funding. Um, yeah, the, 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 what was the, sorry, I, I lost the second question. The second question was about accessing markets. So I think, I think really what I've seen from the questions is the question around, how do startups access funding in general? You know, do you have any advice for them, for entrepreneurs to gain information around accessing funding? And then second to that, similarly, how do they access new markets? What has your experience been? Kenneth, can you hear us? Yes, uh, for, for startups to access funding. Yeah. And I, I think it's just, uh, first of, just educate yourself about the, the types of funding that there is out there and knowing. For example, the Global Startup Startup Awards is at the early stage, but entrepreneurs need to know that funding comes in stages. Like you get it at grants, so you should be entering competitions and knowing where they are. Hi, it's Kenneth here. You, you, you should be knowing grants and and where they are at the early stage, but also as well that uh, you should, on the other hand, be knowing who will fund you when you are seed stage, and and actively finding them, uh, finding them wherever they are publicly. So perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Kenneth. And I, I can comment as well, having been in the industry, um, having worked with awards all over the world, having seen how the Global Startup Awards is operating in different continents around the world. The reality is that being able to be part of communities that are pan-African and global is incredibly important in terms of what you can learn, in terms of who you can network, and in terms of staying in touch with the most up-to-date, most accessible opportunities for entrepreneurs on the continent. I want to thank you all for your time. I know it was a jam-packed session. I really thank you to the speakers who took their time to be part of this conversation. It's the start of something very big. And if any of you would like to get involved in any capacity, whether that is contributing towards the fund, whether that is co-investing, whether that is entering the Global Startup Awards, becoming an ecosystem partner, a mentor, any program, we are running a significant Pan-African network and looking to include as many partners as possible. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, if you have any questions, we've put up some, some contact details on the screen here, but I want to thank you all for your time. We are capturing all of the comments that you made, and we will be posting them, sharing them, getting back in touch with all of you. And please make sure that you get onto these websites, either Gig Africa or the Global Startup Awards Africa. You can visit us at Loud Hela and engage. We are actively here to grow innovators and disruptors on the continent to be some of the best in the world. We're looking forward to working with everybody. Have a wonderful time. Take care and be safe.